Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kevin Corris and I'll be filling in for Kim tonight as she is on a well-earned, well-deserved break. So the producers of the show have given me the reins. <laughs> Kidding, it's gonna be a fun show. I'm very excited. Joining me tonight as always are our experts from UNL Extension answering our questions about all those insects. We have Dr. Fred Baxendale. Welcome, Fred. Great to be here. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, answering our questions about turf and weed, we have Bill Kreuzer. Hi, Bill. Hello, everybody. Our rotty, spotty, stinky, slimy guy is Lauren Giesler tonight. Hello, Lauren. Great to be here, Kevin. And our sitting in the horse seat is, is the lovely Sarah Browning. Welcome, everybody. Good evening, Kevin. All right. Well, you can uh, get your questions answered tonight by dialing 402-472-1212 if you're calling from the Lincoln area or toll free at 1-800-676-5446. Uh, we'll also take your questions via email uh, for any future show. Um, and that address is byf at unl.edu. When you send us a question, please give us as much information as you can about your plant health problem and include where you live, because that helps us answer the question. Uh, remember, though, uh, throughout the week, you can follow Backyard Farmer um, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, and Pinterest. So. Before we get to your questions, as we are wont to do, we like to start with samples. So Fred, you have some sticks. Yes, yes. These sticks, though, are infested with oyster shell scale. You know, scale insects are, are one of the more common pests that we find within our landscapes, uh, and, and even including turf. And so uh, it's one that I thought we would bring in. And uh, this is actually on aspen. Uh, so one of the more more common plants and it's going to be very difficult for you to see and I brought a, another one more example to show how severe it can get but you know these little tiny dots that we're seeing on here you know those look all look like like a miniature oyster uh, shell so hence the name oyster shell scale. Uh, and again, uh, they can be, they're on over 100 different species of plants. So they're on essentially everything in the landscape. They like particularly things like lilac and uh, all, all the spirea and, and many, many other, other plants, over 100 different species. Mm. I'm just going to show one more uh, example, then I'm going to tell you what to do about them. You know, so this is one, you can sort of just see this rough texture on here. Let me, so it's not shaking. Uh, and again, this is one that probably has like four or five generations of these oyster shell scales, and they totally cover the bark. And in fact, this branch is dead. Now, this one is still alive, doesn't have too many, but ultimately they will actually kill the branches. And if there's enough, they can actually kill the entire tree. So what do you do? Well, one is inspection. You need to go out and make sure if you see trees, plants that are wilting, that there's issues, you know, you might want to inspect it. Look at the, uh, look at the, look at the canes to see if in fact it might have, uh, might have oyster shell or another scale insect, right? The only time that we can effectively control these insects is during what's called the crawler stage. That's the immature stage that comes from the eggs that then spread out and infest new parts of the of the plant. So, uh, and that's when we need to control them. They're relatively easy to control. For oyster shell scale, that's gonna be happening pretty quick. You know, mid-May through, oh, maybe, maybe uh, the first of July. So again, if you go out and you can take a, a little branch and you can uh, take a little piece of white paper and do a little tap test over the plant and see if you see the little yellow crawlers. And that would be the time, the time to, to treat. treat. All right, so. okay. Well, thank you so much, Fred. So go out there and inspect your plants. All right, Bill, we've got uh, some kind of a Russian doll situation. Yeah, here we on. go, <laughs> follow the cup, follow the cup. No, um, I'm not really here to talk about that tonight. I'm here to talk about uh, irrigation. We've had a lot of rain, but the forecast is really heating up. And so, uh, you know, people might be thinking about, do I need to start fertilizing my, my lawn and my landscape? And one of the things we like to say uh, for best management, and this is how I like to fertil or water my lawn, is when it looks droughty, I just put down about an inch of water and then I turn it back off again until I see drought. And so in the past, we'd say use a tuna can and, uh, you know, put that out there. When the tuna can's full, you've got about an inch of water, three quarters of an inch. Well, not a lot of people eat tuna. And so I like to just use these guys, uh, just caps from 
uh, you know, various things like shaving cream, <clears throat> spray paint. If it's square, I just scatter them across my yard. So if this is my yard, I'll put one over here and one over there and one over here and uh, you know, I'll water and then I'll just see after an hour of irrigation, you know, how much water you got put down and then I know how much uh, an inch of, of water is. And so and you, as you're throwing out these cans, you know, just grab the tops and throw them into a bin. And then once a year, just put them around your irrigation system and uh, you know, and run it in the spring, see how much water goes out and then just become a little bit more precise in how you water with some really inexpensive, uh, you know, trash for right. recycling. Great, well, thanks a lot, Bill. It's always good to be water wise. Yeah. All right, Lauren, it looks like maybe you're getting ready to go out to the ball game. You got your sunflower seeds? Yeah, so uh, I brought along a snack tonight. And uh, the reason I brought this along is it is baseball season. A lot of people are out eating sunflower seeds. And I am betting that some of our viewers have ran into one of my favorite pathogens while you're eating sunflower seeds. And that is sclerotinia, uh, which is known as white mold to our, our viewers that are farmers that grow soybeans. Here's some actual sclerotia. And any of you that have actually uh, encountered these, maybe you were eating a bag of sunflower seeds and uh, you had just some off-tasting little black body in your mouth and you spit it out and you were like, what's that? Well, white mold of sunflower is one of the most significant diseases that affects it. And these little bodies are their sclerotia of how it survives and moves around. And it can exist for many, many years. This little brown one is the one that I had in my mouth last night that I just kept because I thought it'd be fun to share. So these are some other ones. We have active research projects in our department about uh, sclerotinia. And, and so we just got some out of the lab to bring along to show you the different sizes and things. But you will, you will see these in sunflower seeds. It's very common. Um, we actually have our current department head, Dr. Jim Stedman, has worked on this pathogen for over 40 years and is one of our world-renowned experts on sclerotinia. So, uh, a lot of knowledge at the University of Nebraska about it. Um, again, a disease that maybe some of our, our home gardeners have seen uh, mm. affecting petunias or other species has over 400 plant species it can wow. infect. So uh, uh, just a, a really neat disease and something that many of you, maybe if you're not active gardeners, run into in a sunflower seed bag. That's awesome, Lauren, thank you. So maybe inspect that handful of sunflower yeah. seeds before you pop them in your mouth. And, and no reason to worry about getting sick because we actually tried some and they're okay. So. <laughs> All righty, thanks again, Lauren. Uh, Sarah, we have some curled up leaves, it looks like, over there. Yeah, we're still having trouble with herbicide damage in the landscape, Kevin. And I know you uh, had, had some samples on the show a couple of weeks ago, and you were showing some uh, herbicide damage on hosta and, and um, redbud. This is herbicide damage on ash. Uh, I've been getting a, a, quite a lot of calls about problems on ash for some reason this year. And the way, it's, it's pretty characteristic the way these um, leaflets are kind of curled under, cupped under like this, that this is herbicide damage. Um, here we have um, herbicide damage on maple. And you can see early in the season, the leaves were developing normally, but once the, the drift situation occurred, then we start to have these, these uh, kind of uniquely deformed leaves, which is pretty characteristic of probably either 2,4-D or dicamba drift um, on these plants. And then here I have also a sample of uh, ornamental pear. And there we had a fairly normally shaped leaf early in the season. And then here is the, the deformed leaf that occurred after the drift. And here up at the tip, we even have some more severe symptoms where the petioles are just completely curling under. So um, we see a lot of this type of damage uh, in the spring, especially when uh, the broadleaf weed products are being sprayed for dandelion control early in the season. At this point, there's really nothing you can do for these plants. Uh, usually what happens is the, the growth will be stunted for a while, two or three weeks, and then eventually these plants will start to grow out of the damage and you'll get normally shaped leaves again. Um, so there's nothing really you can do, but generally speaking, we don't see plants being killed by herbicide uh, drift. They just are stunted for a while and um, they don't put on as, as full of a canopy sometimes. So maybe just be considerate of when we're applying these things, make sure the wind speed yeah. is low and it's right. not super hot outside. Exactly. Follow, follow the labels. My, grape, avoid this. My, my grapes get absolutely hammered. Yeah, yeah. grapes yeah. are really sensitive to 2,4-D. So. Tomatoes really too. And tomatoes, tomatoes. as well. And <clears throat> you know, Sarah, we get a lot of comments on this compared to some of our viruses. Mm -hmm. So for example, tomato plants can look like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're always talking about making sure it's not a virus and not that. Right, so, exactly. Um, but usually they and, see all their plants affected if right. it's Right, and drift, like in this so. landscape, we had multiple species of plants that were all affected, and with, with a virus, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see that. It would be more host-specific. So if you're seeing a more generalized effect, that yeah. might give you a, a clue that mm -hmm. it possibly is herbicide it's, it's rather herbicide. than virus. Many different mm -hmm. plants affected, mm -hmm. yeah. 
All righty, well, let's move on to picture questions. And Fred, you have the first picture tonight, and it's of a peach tree. And this may, I can see why maybe it was confused with an insect, but may not be an insect issue. Could you talk about this? Yeah, that, that sort of looks like an insect gall. So, but actually it's, it's a disease called, it's a fungal disease called peach leaf curl. And this is probably more appropriately discussed by, by Lauren. Uh, he's the expert. Well, and this is, uh, anytime we have years where we, we see uh, breaking in bud dormancy, uh, where it's warmer and then gets cooler and we get wet conditions, that's actually where this fungus would, would infect that developing bud in those leaves to where you get that blistering. So. Um, you're, you're right, Fred, that's what I'd say it is too. And um, it, it's something that you can manage, although in years where you don't get bud dormancy broken early, you typically won't see much of it. I always get peach leaf curl on my, you know, on my peach tree, you know, and I usually treat it with lime sulfur or yeah, one of the red. dormant spray. Yeah, as a dormant, as a dormant <laughs> spray, and it just, Typically not going to kill the tree though, it's unsightly. Yeah, may yeah. Cause and the, leaf but the leaf, but the and the leaves drop mm -hmm. eventually, right. and so then right. everything looks fine. Alrighty, thanks guys. Um, Bill, the next picture is for you. This is a lawn that appears to be in some shade. It's a little bit thinner in this area. This is a Petersburg viewer sending us this photo. Kind of just wanting to know um, what she can do to green it up, and you know, trying to grow. That grass in the shade. Yeah, I think some of the question too was about <clears throat> right on the, the the cement. You'll see that there's a little bit darker green and then it's lighter green, and they thought maybe the shade was causing that. And based on how it's a stark line like that, I'm going to say it's probably not the shade. It's something we've been seeing a lot this year. Uh, some of the grasses just took forever to to break dormancy. It got so cold. It was so cold in May, early May, and it rained. Then it finally got hot, and now the grass is growing. And so up until like a week ago, you know, something like these newer improved bluegrasses just weren't growing. And um, so I think we had to be a little bit patient. If you still see it throughout the summer, um, and not just during the fall or the spring when we're going into and out of dormancy, uh, then I think something else. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure it's just a, a, a delaying green up. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, Lincoln viewer, Lauren has some sad strawberries, and we'll get, I think we have an image here, yeah. You got an idea what's going on there, how to treat it? There's a few different things. I'm gonna just talk about general uh, strawberry management, because fruit rots like this, we can have uh, leather rot, uh, which is one that's actually uh, caused by soil contact and a fungus that's in the soil. Uh, we can have some botrytis that actually will infect the fruit and do some soft rots as well. So the first thing is if you can make sure you have a straw mulch down, so that your fruit is not contacting soil. Uh, if you've done that, if you see flower buds blight it, uh, you could have uh, the botrytis blight that would also produce some of those soft rots on fruit. So uh, with that one, um, you know, at this point, we're already getting fruit production really hard to manage, but next year when you get into flowering, that's where you'd want to look at maybe one even a copper spray or something like that that's more organic for your backyard garden. But first of all, just try to, try to make sure you got a good mulch down, uh, make sure you're not getting fruit contact with soil, and then avoid any overhead irrigation, use a soaker hose, uh, and those things are gonna help a lot. But if you're still in that situation where you're seeing some of the blighted uh, and, and, and burnt flowers, uh, then that's where you're gonna, gonna need to take some other action. Thanks, Lauren. We gotta save the strawberries, my yeah. favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, the next picture is going to you, and this is of a maple tree that's also kind of sad. Um, this is from another Lincoln viewer. Um, can't see it quite with this, this photo, but um, we're gonna get a, a up close and personal look here at the trunk, and that might give us some suggestion on what's going on mm -hmm. here. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of bark damage on trees this year, um, but I think this one might actually be related to um, maybe some root issues or planting issues, because you look at the sides of that trunk and you can see they're going straight down into the ground like the sides of a telephone pole, which indicates this tree is planted <clears throat> too deeply. We'd like to see the base of the trunk flaring out into a nice root flare, which would indicate that the tree was planted properly. So sometimes what can happen is if a tree is planted too deeply, you can actually end up having root death. And so as roots die back, that can translate into death of the bark above them. And so you, since that split is right at the base of the trunk, I'm thinking that this might be related to some root issues. Now I think the, call, the question was, uh, is this gonna be an opening for insects? Yes, uh, insects could attack that, that dead wood in the center of that tree. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in my opinion, more seriously, you're going to get wood rot entering into the base of that tree as well. And eventually it will rot away all the wood that was there at the time of the injury. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to prevent wood rot, but you can certainly inspect the tree, keep your eye out for insects. If, they, if you see any insects starting to attack the base of the tree, then you can, um, you can address them. But they are more of a secondary issue. Uh, they certainly are not what caused this split at the base. Uh, and, they, and if you did have insects coming in, they would probably just be attacking the dead wood uh, in the center, not the actual living wood around the so outside of the tree. Environmental, just pay attention to planting depth. And right, exactly. All righty, thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. All righty, well, good gardeners understand how to handle and use chemical pesticides and herbicides safely around their home. For our first feature tonight, Rock gives us some important tips to understanding toxicity. Life is about risks. We want to minimize risks, especially when we're working in the lawn and garden. There's a group of scientists out there called toxicologists whose responsibility to, is to understand compounds and things we encounter on our day-to-day -day lives as whether they're toxic and at what level the toxicity occurs. So risk equals toxicity times exposure. So by using least toxic approaches, we can minimize our risk. I want to talk today specifically about toxicology or toxicity. Toxicity is defined as often as an LD50, which stands for lethal dose, which kills 50% of a population of surrogate animals like guinea pigs and rats and, and other things. And that's how we measure because we can't really reasonably do testing on humans. The higher the LD50, the lower the toxicity. That's because LD50 is the amount in milligrams per kilogram of body weight that it would take for a 50% probability that an individual would pass away. It sounds really, really horrible, but the reality of it is, is that if you understand a little bit about toxicology and, and toxicity, you can do a better job in making the choices of the things you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, not only in the home and garden, but just off the shelf. We've moved into the lab to show you some commonly consumed articles, as well as the herbicide glyphosate, to get a better understanding of what it means to be toxic or to have an LD50. Remember, the higher the LD50, the lower the toxicity. Now let's take a look at these each individually from the highest to the lowest toxicity. The most toxic of the compounds is common baby aspirin. It has an LD50 of 200 milligrams per kilogram. The least toxic is dihydrogen oxide commonly known as water, but it does have an LD50. The LD50 exceeds 10,000 for water. Table salt has a LD50 of 3,000 milligrams per kilogram. Sugar, which is 10 times less toxic than salt, has a LD50 of 30,000 milligrams per kilogram. And one of my favorites, caffeine in coffee, has an LD50 of approximately 140 milligrams per kilogram. The herbicide glyphosate has an LD50 of 5,600 milligrams per kilogram, making it one of the least toxic of all of the articles in front of us. It's important you understand that we're certainly not saying that you can consume Roundup. That is not what we're saying. What we are saying, however, is that when you work with any product or when you're eating, things are going to have a certain level of toxicity to them. And let's be careful when we use herbicides or any pesticide for that matter in the environment. It's eye-opening to see the relative toxicity of common household products and it's really great to see Rock all dressed up like that. <laughs> uh, even those not intended for use in your garden. So thanks Rock for that. And without further ado, we will move on to some more photos. And we're going back oh. to you, Fred. Okay. Um, we have a basic what is this kind of question from a viewer east of Lincoln. Uh, Seeing some kind of. Yeah, a little, a little, sort of a little frothy mass at the base of that, of that plant. The, those, these are. This is a spittle bug or spittle bugs that are in that frothy mass. And it's real it's really cool. It's one of my very favorite insects. And again, uh, it, we'll, we'll uh, pull one out here in just a second and give you a, show you one. But it's OK. So th they, they produce this frothy, frothy mass for a couple of reasons. One, it protects uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 
uh, spittle bugs, immature spittle bugs from the environment, from the uh, adverse conditions, and also from, per from predators. So this is a really slimy, nasty mass. And so what happens is, you know, predators are not going to try to go into that, birds or whatever, and try to do that. So I, I brought one along, if we can just sort of switch really quickly, and you can see it's a sort of a slimy mass. This came out of our a linden tree, and I'm just gonna pull it out of my finger, like this, and right here, here are the nymphs. So here, here are the immature, see how slimy and nasty it is? Okay. Uh, but, somebody didn't cough that up, right? There you are. <laughs> okay. There it is, and here, 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 here are two nymphs that are within that frothy mass. And of course, it, it's slimy and nasty, and so it's really good to protect the, uh, the nymph, and also, probably more importantly, uh, it uh, protects that nymph from predators. All right, kids, don't play with spit. That's gross. But so, and, and what, do people need to do anything about it? Should they be worried well, about well, it? Well, here's Enjoy what's sort it. of interesting about this, because it, it, this just came, so it, it's sweet. <laughs> oh, Fred. <laughs> it's, 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 right. We're crossing okay, the line. Yeah. I know well, farmer. Awesome. All right. Again, I don't recommend you try that at home, but. <laughs> a, it, it wouldn't hurt you. Well, uh, some of uh, nature's wondrous <laughs> and tasteful <Very> pageantry. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Uh, Bill, the next yeah. picture goes to you. Um, this is a weed uh, from a carny viewer that's popping up in their buffalo grass and in their sidewalk it looks too. Yeah, that looks a lot like bindweed, uh, probably field bindweed. It's the most common of the bindweeds. It is a perennial plant and is a nemesis of me and my wife. <clears throat> it grows between our retaining walls even. It's pretty amazing. The thing about uh, bindweed is it's a perennial. Um, so again, something you, you probably gonna wanna treat in the fall to help it has these real deep rhizomatous roots that are going to store energy uh, to help it over winter. And so if you just pull it, you're just going to kind of, you know, make it mat. And it's going to grow more and more and more as those rhizomes start to put up uh, plants. So uh, it's, it's something that's really difficult to control. If it's in your lawn, you want to have that, you know, nice high mowed lawn, three inches, you know, three to four fertilizer wraps a year for a new lawn, two to three for an older lawn, mow properly. But if you still have issues and it still pops up in highly maintained lawns, uh, the one herbicide that's actually really effective is what they use for crabgrass, and it's uh, quincrack. Uh, and so uh, you can actually get crabgrass killer, and that will, will kill, and it's one of the few herbicides that actually is effective. 2,4-D won't work on it. Uh, so you can you know, use a crab, that crabgrass herbicide, but it will knock out that bindweed. All righty. So Last case scenario, worst case scenario, some quinclorac. Yeah, I mean, because if you pull it, you're not going to do anything. Aside from that, it's like you know, the roundup of, you know, glove of death thing, but the quinclorac is a lot safer than doing that. So. All right, thanks, Bill. Spot treat. Lauren, we have a swamp white oak with a leaf that is not looking too good. Um, any thoughts? Okay, so uh, a few different things. So, again, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about tephrina and, and leaf curl with wet springs, and anthracnose can be pretty bad with wet springs as well. Uh, so one of the things that came to mind on this was the possibility also there in that leaf, you can kind of see that margin where you get the edge uh, distortion too. Um, so I think that's what we're dealing with. Sometimes in oaks we see on the twig dieback, they'll get anthracnose, and then they'll also have uh, some other uh, minor fungal diseases that can infect the twigs and kill them back, and anthracnose can do that as well. So uh, in either case, I think that's probably what you're dealing with. Um, it, it usually won't kill the tree. It just depends on how far advanced this tree is and how old it is, how large it is, and how much disease you have. And in an earlier planted tree, you know, a younger tree, you may need to control it to try to make sure you're getting maximum growth, and that's where that fungicide application early on in the season would help. Uh, if it's a larger tree and you just have a little bit of this, I really wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, thanks. So maybe some sanitation, cleaning up those leaves mm -hmm. in the fall as well helps reduce that fungal load in, in the environment. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Lauren. All righty, uh, Sarah, um, we have a spruce tree, and basically the callers from Henderson, Nebraska, just wanting to know, are they going to have issues with spider mites? Is this, is this something that they should keep? There's been a lot of spruce issues. Um, just you know, it's uh, it's such a poor shaded tree. They kind of just have questions on. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of a poorly shaped tree. Yeah. And I'm wondering if Shape. possibly the central leader has died back, either died back or been broken out or something. And that's why you're getting these kind of uh, side branches developing like this, almost in a weeping sort of a shape. Uh, unless this is a weeping spruce. Now, if they bought mm. a specialty plant, which is a weeping spruce, then that's how this plant is supposed to grow. 
Uh, and if that's not the case, if it's a normal spruce, a Black Hills or a, a Colorado spruce, then you may have to reestablish a new central leader. And so what you're going to need to do is pull up one of those side branches into an upright position, stake it up for a year or, or a year and a half until it takes over as that new central leader. So the question about the mites. Well, uh, spruces are prone to a couple of different kinds of mites. And maybe, Fred, I should actually let you talk about that if you want to. Well, sure. Again, uh, we're, we're almost past the season where we would worry too much about spruce spider mite. But again, spruce are very susceptible. And what you want to look for is browning of needles and uh, sort of discoloration. Uh, I didn't see any of that in this particular sample. Mm -hmm. So I, offhand, I would Looks say... Looks like a really healthy tree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the leader thing or unless right. it turns out to yeah, be... Yeah, so if it's just so, the shape issues, yeah. then, yeah. But, but you always need to watch your spruce for... Uh, spruce spider mite. Sure. Yeah. Just keep an eye on yeah. it. Keep but right. this didn't look right. like it had it. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, with some fortunate weather for the past week, we've been able to get uh, most of the garden planted. So this week, horticultural assistant Terry James shows us another project out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're looking at some dry weather, so we're hoping to get the rest of our garden planted. We're also looking at finishing up some of the last vegetables that we have. We received our sweet potatoes via the mail. They didn't look very good when they first came in. That will be normal if you get plants via mail order. We kind of gave them a little bit of drink before we put them in, and we actually are putting them in our straw bale garden that we're doing this year. Pretty excited about seeing how this is gonna work. A little bit of prep work, about two, three weeks to actually get the straw bales ready before we can plant anything into it. But we just have a few things. We have some tomatoes and some peppers and that's where our sweet potatoes are going. It should be a great area to get some really big fat sweet potatoes from our new sweet potato slips. So next time you're in, on campus, stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out our garden. That hay bale garden is just loaded with vegetables. It'll be fun to see how that works out this year. All right, um, we have some questions now. Um, first one's coming to you, Fred. Uh, caller is wanting to know they have large black ants that are building large hills in the lawn. What are they and, and how do they deal with that? Oh, if they're large, but they are probably what are called cornfield ants. You know, if you know if they're, you know, they, they wouldn't be carpenter ants uh, because they would live in homes or they might be in trees. But this, if it's a mound, it's a, it's a cornfield ants and they're relatively easy to control. What you need to do is get some one of the amdro or one of the ant baits and then you just sprinkle that over the top of the bait. Uh, and, and you know, or over the top of the mound and that'll control them. Now, you know, if they aren't causing any problems and they really don't, uh, you know, again, just leave them alone. There's no reason to kill them if you don't need to, thing. but if you do, a little bit of, uh, a little of Andrew will take care of them. All righty, well, thanks a lot for it. Okay, I'm um, coming to you, Bill. Uh, we have a caller from the Columbus area wanting to know, they, they're having some issues with they just say fungus in the turf, which I'm assuming could be powdery mildew. But th what they want to know is that it might get hot and dry coming up here. Is it okay to dethatch and aerate to kind of thin, increase airflow for the, for the fungus it, running into this hot weather? Is that something they should avoid or is that okay to do? Uh, we're kind of getting past the dethatching window. Um, it was very short this year with it being so cold that, um, you know, the grass wasn't growing. They could still do it. If you don't have a lot of thatch, I probably wouldn't do it, to especially if it's for a fungal issue. Uh, just, you know, let it grow itself out. Um, as it, the weather changes, it may disappear entirely because you know, the fungi and disease are so weather dependent. So I would just be patient. Okay. All righty. The other thing they might want to do is if they have any canopies of trees, they can thin to get more light penetration or air movement in there. Yeah. That might help yeah. as well. Yeah, chainsaw at the base takes care chainsaw of it really the base. well. It makes yeah. a nice turf area. So right. cutting down trees for the sake of the lawn. All right, talking to two turf guys over there, that's for sure. All right, Lauren, um, we have a caller, does not say where from, could be anywhere in Nebraska, judging by the question. They have spots on their ash tree leaves that are orangish in color, brownish mm. on ash. Um, that's going to be a rust disease, and that's pretty prevalent this year, actually. I've seen it in a lot of, a lot of places. Um, we just had the right moisture conditions. Most of those cycle from, I'm not sure which, but one of the ornamental grasses. 
So some of the ornamental grasses will produce a spore type that infects the ash, just like cedar apple rust, uh, and then it'll go back. So uh, I wouldn't recommend any management on that uh, at this point. For sure, you're past the infection points. So you're not going to do anything if it's something that's really uh, having a big effect on the tree and you wanted to spray next year, like three weeks ago, then you can deal with it. All right, okay. No. So not going to cause any wouldn't die back or, treatment or anything on it like too. that. Just enjoy the cool, yeah. bright, beautiful orange spots. It's a neat to see. <laughs> we'll get some uh, sunflower seeds, set down under it, and just enjoy the <laughs> Watch all. out for the sclerosis. Yeah. <laughs> all righty, Sarah, uh, is it too late to pick asparagus? When's the window? Can we still... Can we still pick and eat asparagus or is it getting too late? It, it kind of depends on how big and mature your plants are. If, if your plants are still producing spears that are, um, uh, you know, close to a half inch across, that, that might not be quite the right measurement, more like um, three-eighths of an inch. But if they're, if they're bigger than a pencil, then you can still harvest. If this, once the stems start to get uh, smaller and more thin and spindly, then you definitely want to stop because that's indicating that the vigor of the plant is declining and that's the point at which your plants need to just develop some foliage and, and photosynthesize and grow for the rest of the summer so you have good production next year. So we are reaching the end of the harvest period here. Thanks for staying with us here on Backyard Farmer. Later on in the program, Bill will be giving us some tips on zoysia grass, which I'm told we've never featured on Backyard Farmer until now. Must be because I'm hosting, I'm not sure. Uh, and you can still get your uh, gardening questions answered by dialing 1-800-676-5446. While you're doing that, we are going to start the lightning round. So Sarah, are you ready? I am ready. 30 minutes, seconds on the clock. Here we go. Why do so many maple trees have prolific seeding this year? Uh, we had a good period for bloom production and we didn't have any frost in that time that killed the flowers. So we had a lot of good pollination, a lot of good seed set. All right. What is the best way to get rid of Russian sage that has become a garden thug? Uh, Russian sage. So you can dig it out or you can cut the stems down and do a stump treatment like we would with a, 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 shrubby, a shrubby type of weed. And so I would use Roundup, concentrated, paint it on the stump. All righty. Will tomato plants with 2,4-D uh, damage on the top recover? They will eventually grow out of it. They will uh, be definitely slowed down, uh, probably for a month or so. Can you put walnut shells into the garden and till them in? No. Do ash trees need to be fed like maple and oak trees? Actually, we don't recommend a lot of fertilizing on any of those trees. Uh, generally, our soils have good levels of fertility, and especially if you're fertilizing the lawn a couple of times a year, your plants are getting plenty of fertility from that. So unless you're seeing a specific nutrient deficiency, we would not recommend fertilization. Can I, oh, <laughs> great job, Sarah. I almost snuck another one in there, but we were too late. All right, great. How, I didn't even see, how many did you get? A bunch, awesome. Okay, moving on. Lauren, are you ready? I am, and Kevin, just remember, we are the same. We're, we're both true. pathologists, so I'm <laughs> counting on a little benefit here tonight. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make them okay. harder for you. Oh. All, right. All righty, so 30 seconds on the clock. Lauren, is there still a problem with downy mildew in impatience? Yes, but uh, I grow impatience every year. It's still not an issue. Okay. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> is the fruit on a peach with peach leaf curl safe to eat? Yes. If it hasn't been sprayed with fungicide? Yes. And watch the post-harvest interval on that when you're doing your treatments. How do I control mushrooms and turf? Um, there's really not a good way to do that. The best thing is to make sure you're not incorporating organic material in the establishment timer when you're developing that landscape and make sure you don't have any buried uh, wood material. Okay. My onions are rotty, soggy, stinky, smelly. Do I need to remove the soil? Pass. This should be minus one. Pass. <laughs> oh, so, uh, <laughs> All right, so there's a flat white fungus on cedar bark and ap the apple tree next to it. Flat white looks like paint chips. Uh, there are some different canker fungi that can produce this, particularly on apple that you'll see. Watch that limb. You may want to prune that uh, back about, I'm going to say, three to four inches behind the affected area. Uh, Aster yellow showing up already. Any treatments? Question mark? Aster yellows, rogue it out. Rogue it out. Great. De oh. Keep getting caught. Five. All right, we're all tied. Great. Good job, Lauren. All right. We'll go back to the onion great. later. All right. So I keep saying a minute on the clock. I'm wrong. It's only 30 seconds, but you guys are just killing it. All right, Bill, here it comes. 30 seconds. Best time to spray wild violets? Uh, fall. All righty. Fescue has gone to seed. Will this be, uh, become a good lawn? No. No. I would count on it. Oh, it is a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's hot and dry predicted. Uh, how, how much water and how often? 
Yeah, you want to just look at the lawn and just use your eyes to tell you when you need to water. You can always stick like a you know something into the ground if it's hard, but even that's not a great uh, indicator because tall fescue's got deep roots, and so that might just indicate the top, and it could be water below that. Okay, a Lincoln viewer has plugged some buffalo grass this week. Mm -hmm. How do they keep the weeds out? Yeah, we like to uh, go out with a mesotrion application because it really helps keep the weeds at bay, uh, and it really helps to encourage German uh, su successful establishment. We did it this week. All righty. Will power raking dead grass spots be enough for reseeding? Uh, yeah, generally power raking helps. You can even seed, you can do it on top of the seed, but generally if you just rough it up first, and then you put the seed on top. Aerating, anything you can do to disturb the soil is gonna help. All right, we have uh, round pale spots showing up in a shaded area. They don't have dogs because it'd be disease, insect. It could be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I won't take credit for that one. Give me half point maybe on that one. <laughs> All yeah. right, thanks, Bill. You guys are doing great. I'm not, I, can't, I apparently don't know how much time we have. All righty, it's coming down to you, Fred. Are you ready? I'm ready. First question. Honeybees are using the outside of a house as a hive. How can someone get rid of them? Oh, you really need to co contact a, a local beekeeper uh, or the State Department and have them come and removed. It, there, it would be very dangerous to do it yourself. All righty. Um, if someone already has pollinators, what's the benefit of becoming certified? Why should they become certified? Well, I mean, certainly if, if you know something about, you know, about pollination, uh, you can become certified. Um, can imidacloprid still be used on linden trees? Uh, no, because of, because of the action, the uh, uh, systemic action uh, with pollinators, uh, they're trying to re eliminate the use of that product uh, uh, because of the, the pollinator okay. problem. Is it time to treat for bagworms? Getting really close, uh, probably in the next week or two. And the whole key is you want to make sure you want to control them before the, the little bags are a half an inch in length. Okay, with what product? Uh, I, you know, I like bifenthrin, uh, permethrin, uh, seven. All righty. Great, great, great. We have a winner, Bill. All righty, excellent. <laughs> yes, Good no, job, Bill. no, Quiet. yes, no. <laughs> All righty, Sarah, what beautiful pageantry has Gladys brought in this week? Uh, Gladys brought us two perennials, uh, both in the Campanula family, and uh, the common name for these are bell flowers, and you can kind of understand that when you look at the shape of the, the flowers here, kind of, kind of bell-shaped. So this taller one that she has is called creeping bell flower, or Campanula ranunculoides, and uh, it grows usually about um, 18 to a little over two feet tall. Um, it is a perennial and it grows from rhizomes, so it will kind of slowly spread through the garden. Uh, the second one that she brought for us here in the front with these bigger flower heads, this one is called clustered bell flower. And you can mm -hmm. kind of understand that because we have so many individual flowers all clustered together in, in one flower head. Um, so they both prefer uh, kind of well-drained soil um, full sun to maybe a little bit of afternoon shade, and uh, they both make really nice cut flowers. So uh, clustered bellflower and creeping bellflower uh, from Gladys today. All righty, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Mm -hmm. All righty, um, Fred, you get the next picture, which I believe is from a Bellevue viewer. It's basically a, what is this? They saw it on their deck in the morning. Oh, nope, I apologize. I'm on the wrong picture. This is, I believe, a, a cherry. cherry tree yeah. from an Omaha viewer. Um, and it's, it's this had trouble budding out. It's got some issues. What might be going on? You know, and again, I'm going to sort of uh, include Sarah in this in this conversation. So, okay, so so what we're seeing is a flower that's that's died. Okay, and, you know, I wish we had a picture of the entire tree. It'd be nice to know if that tree, if all the branches look like that, if the whole tree is, is dead. I mean, things I would think of would be things like uh, winter kill, uh, maybe frost damage, you know, so if we had a, a better picture of the entire tree, mm -hmm. we might know. Mm -hmm. Your and thoughts? It's, it's not uncommon if a tree is declining. It's kind of its last ditch effort to try to reproduce is to bloom in the spring but then oftentimes after the flowers are done, the, the buds just die and then it never leaves out. That, that was the last bit of stored energy it had that it used up in the, the flower production and then it just died. So if all the branches are bare, I think yeah. unfortunately she's lost. Maybe time to replace. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you guys both. All righty, Bill, here we have a plant ID question and I do not have a location on this one. Just a what is it? It's wild four o'clock. It's a perennial and it produces a lot of seed. I think it's called four o'clock because it 
The flowers open up about four o'clock. Is that sound right? Later at dusk. Yeah. Later in the day. So uh, that's cool. um, it was kind of new for me to learn about that one because I honestly didn't know. Not surprising. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, just pull its tap root. And um, if it does go to seed, it's going to go everywhere. So you want to just you know pull it before it goes to seed, and you'll find otherwise you'll find those seedlings uh, popping up in those areas that are you know, along fences and tough to mow or maintain. Alrighty. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Lauren, we have a maple tree. Maybe has maybe has an issue that we've already talked about here, some spots on a maple, what do you think? Well, a couple of things. We talked about anthracnose earlier with the oak. Um, the other one that it could be is tar spot. Mm. Uh, so uh, those two, um, both common things you could see on maple. Just the way this looks, I'm not seeing as much distorted margin. I'm really wondering if it's not tar spot, but uh, it's one of those in, in either event. And so if you're seeing this across the entire tree, if it's a younger tree, you know, I would take note of this and next year look at some management. Once you start seeing this much disease development on any, any plant in your landscape, it's very difficult to come in with some sort of an application and do some management. Uh, the other thing is if it's a smaller tree, for example, and you have some irrigation heads that are hitting it, if you can redirect it, water uh, and leaf wetness is going to favor any of these. So uh, just do that. And then in the fall, if it is tar spot, you can do some sanitation to try to uh, reduce the potential for that. All right. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Sarah, an Aurora viewer, has some sick rhubarb. What should she be doing? Well, so the first things that come to mind when I look at this is possibly it's planted too deep. Um, rhubarb, especially the, the newer cultivars, are not quite as vigorous as some of the older ones. And so if it's planted too deep, you, you don't get good stem development. So if that crown is buried, you're, you're going to need to dig those up and raise it up so that crown is right at the soil surface and then replant it. Another possibility is maybe you've just got really heavy soil. I mean, rhubarb is pretty adaptable, but if this is really, really heavy clay, maybe you need to do some soil amendment with some compost or something like that to improve the quality of the soil so you just get better root development and better plant growth overall. Um, watering could also be an issue, either too dry or way too wet. Uh, if it's way too wet, you could be getting some root rot issues going on there, or if it's too dry, plants may just not be thriving because they're... Uh, you know, they're just, you know, gasping for water. So look at some of those basic management issues and see if any of those might ring a bell with what's happening on your plants. All righty, from vegetables to trees, planting depth yeah. is an issue. You Definitely. Be aware. All mm -hmm. right, thank you, Sarah. Well, we've had some fun over the years listening to how much Rock hates zoysia grass. There are some drawbacks to this warm season grass, to be sure, but Bill is going to show us that zoysia grass might not be that bad. I'm here on our new lawn species demonstration plot at the Backyard Farmer Turf Garden on East Campus. And in front of me is zoysia grass. This is the grass I'm sure if you're a regular viewer, you know that Rock hates. And so why does Rock hate this grass and why would you want to consider planting that grass? Uh, we've never even covered zoysia grass in, in the history of Backyard Farmer and so we thought, you know, let's talk about it this year and understand why Rock doesn't like it and, and where it can actually be useful in Nebraska landscape. So zoysia grass is, uh, zoysia is the, is the genus, there's different species of zoysia grass. Uh, it is a warm season grass, like buffalo grass, and so that it's going to want to grow in the summertime. Uh, and then we have that first hard frost in September or October, it's going to go dormant. Uh, and then it won't green up until, you know, May, typically in Nebraska. Uh, when it does grow, it will grow very vigorously, and it has both uh, rhizomes, which are stems in the ground in the soil, and stolons, which are stems on the surface, that help it grow and fill in very aggressively. Uh, being a warm season grass, an advantage is it uses much less water than our cool season grasses like Kentucky bluegrass and turf type tall fescue. Uh, it also doesn't get a ton of diseases, although it can get some certain pest issues. Uh, and so from a in low impact perspective, uh, it, it has some advantages. Uh, one thing you might see this, this grass advertised as, you don't have to mow it very often. And that is true in the sense that when it's dormant, you won't have to, to mow. And so it might shorten your season a little bit in the spring and the fall. But when it's hot out, it actually can grow very vigorously. And, and, and to the point, it's growing very vigorously right now. And so uh, we have to be on top of normal mowing. So it's not a low maintenance grass from that perspective. One of the issues with this grass is that it has terrible cold tolerance. Maybe not as bad as something that you'd find in Florida, but in Nebraska with our tough winters, it can get too cold and it can actually be lethal. And generally what happens is it kills 
maybe not all of the grass, but parts of the grass. And then we get other weeds that come in, bluegrass, tall fescue, and we have a hard time, you know, controlling for either the zoysia grass or for the bluegrass. And so that, that's really limited its use in Nebraska. We now have herbicides, however, that can selectively control either the, the, the cool season grasses or the warm season grasses. Uh, a new one called Pilex can be used to actually control this grass because it is aggressive and it wants to creep and it might creep into your neighbor's cool season lawns and they might not like that very much. So there is some new technology out there. Being a warm season grass, we'd want to establish this grass like buffalo grass late May, early June. Um, you don't want to establish it in the fall. And if you're doing that, a herbicide like mesotrinolin or tenacity is going to be really essential to keeping those weeds at bay. Uh, other things to keep in mind with this grass are that it, um, you know, it's still going to need some fertilizer to get it going, but after that it may not need as much fertilizer as your typical lawn. And majority of that fertilizer wants to go down when it's growing, which is in the middle of the summer. So kind of in conclusion, you know, this is a grass we might want to consider to the far extreme south and southeastern parts of Nebraska, and it could be, it could be a good alternative if we're trying to reduce our water use in our landscape. Zoysia has excellent drought tolerance and it's pretty good at keeping the weeds at bay. Just keep in mind that there are some issues like the fact that it likes to take over the entire neighborhood. So what's the ultimatum, Bill? Should we plant it here in Nebraska? You know, I would say most people know if you're in southeastern Nebraska and southern, in southern Nebraska, yeah, especially uh, like Jeff said last week, if it's in an area that's confined by concrete and it's not going to spread out, it could be a good option. Uh, you might have some death every year. You might have to, you know, reestablish it. But I just wanted to cover it a little bit because the thing is the climate's changing and it becomes more and more applicable. All righty. Thanks a lot, Bill. All righty. We've got one more round of pictures here. And, Fred, you get this one. And uh, this was what I was trying oh. to say before. This is a Bellevue viewer, that's cool. Bellevue viewer that's saying, what is this? That's a green fruit worm. Oh, that's a cool one. Normally, uh, green is fruit, and they, they feed, on, uh, they feed on, on developing fruit, and they chew a little hole into it and cause some damage. They also are, can be a serious pest of roses. So they'll feed right into the rosebud and, you know, drives the, the Rose Society people crazy. So uh, in terms of control, you know, generally they are not very abundant. So rarely do we actually, you know, re require uh, an insecticidal treatment. But if one did, you could use things like bifenthrin or permethrin or seven. Any of those would very effectively control them. But rarely do they reach those kind of numbers. It's just one here, one there. Of course, they're feeding into your rose or into your apple, you know. If they're not causing too much damage, just leave them be. Yeah, in. yeah. Cool. All righty. All righty, Bill, we have an Omaha viewer that would like a plant ID here. Yep, so that one looks like a uh, curly dock. Yeah, we see mm -hmm. a lot of docks out there right now. They're starting to really bolt up. They can get about four feet tall or maybe even taller. You'll see them on, along the sides of the road a lot. Uh, Taproot, it's a perennial, so just really, you know, mow it, or I mean, pull it if you can. Sometimes those roots are pretty deep. You might have to cut it down and just kind of burn off the roots that way. But uh, generally not a really invasive plant. It does make a lot of seeds, though. So if you have an area that's not mowed, not trafficked, you might see it become more and more prevalent. All right, thanks, Bill. Lauren, peonies having some problems, some stippling. This is from a Ulysses viewer. Yeah, and, and this one, um, a couple different things that came to mind. Uh, one was, it, it's not curved like a herbicide injury, uh, but the distorted color in the new growth makes me question if it had a virus, uh, just because of the way it looked. I mean, it, it could be nutritional, but when we get some of these different symptoms that we get modeling in leaves uh, in peonies, where they're perennial, they can accumulate problems, uh, and then we could see that carry out you know, in another year. So I would just watch this one real close. Uh, if you see lower leaves start to, to fire or burning, uh, if you see other symptoms develop, uh, you know, you might want to uh, take a sample into a diagnostic lab uh, just to see what, you know, it, it would be that way. But my, my thought on it initially was some sort of virus, and you may see it completely go away as it warms up because some of those viruses are very temperature dependent. And so you'll see them in perennial plants early, and then later they'll look fine. So see if it, just kind of watch it this year. Alrighty, thanks a lot, Lauren. Um, all right, Sarah, you have an Omaha viewer, um, has a crack in the trunk of a tree, I think Royal Raindrops is the cultivar okay. name, possibly. Okay. Is so it gonna? We're seeing a lot of these types of cracks in trees over the last couple of years, and this is most likely what's called a frost crack. 
which actually occurs in the winter when we get warm days. They usually happen on the south or the southwest side of the tree most commonly. So you get a warm day shining on the bark, the cells expand, and then they contract quickly at night when the temperatures drop and you can end up with a crack like this. Um, the best outcome here is that the tree over the course of the next few years will send out callus tissue and it should be able to seal up that crack. Although sometimes these cracks reappear um, for various reasons as the tree grows. So hopefully what you'll see is that crack will seal up and it'll, you'll just have kind of a little seam there on that side of the tree. But, but these generally are not fatal to the tree. Trees usually can live with these and um, usually they can recover from them fairly well if, if overall the tree is vigorous and healthy. Alrighty, so take care of it and mm. it should maybe seal itself off. Right, All right. right. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I think we have one announcement tonight. Um, you can see on the screen uh, the Monument Valley Irish Show, an annual spring show, is this June 4th and 5th, and that'll be at the UNL Panhandle Research and Extension Center, which is just one mile north of Scott's Bluff. And I believe that's all the announcements for tonight. Fred, we have a viewer that is wanting to know, uh, this is Spirit Lake, Iowa viewer, oh. uh, that wants to know about some insects, possibly beetles on their asparagus and how to control them, chewing on their asparagus. Oh, well, I, I would guess asparagus beetles. Uh, and, you know, the, yeah, we're very original with our, our naming. Uh, and again, they overwinter as adults, so they'll start laying their eggs just when the, when the little spears are just beginning to form sometimes. And you'll, you'll see all these little gray eggs that are all lined up against, they almost look like little miniature aphids, you know, that are all there. But they're the eggs. You know, you have to you prevent that. You know, they, they're relatively easy to control. You could use a product like, like Seven or Permethrin uh, to, to control them fairly well. Again, you always have to watch your pre-harvest interval to make sure, you know, if you're treating asparagus, uh, you have to be very careful about all of that. You know, and, and if possible, you know, if there aren't too many, just wait until you get past what Sarah was talking about earlier. You know, you get past your harvest period, you know, and then you can go ahead and, and treat, treat those. Okay. Thanks a lot. Asparagus beetles. All right, thanks a lot, Fred. Uh, Omaha viewer Bill is wanting to know if there exists a grass species that'll work underneath a pine tree. Yep, uh, probably not. <clears throat> but uh, your best option is going to be uh, tall fescue or fine fescue. I like tall fescue because it's more uh, traffic tolerant. Uh, and so if, if you can't get those two to grow under that pine tree, which you probably won't, look for something else or just do straw mulch, something like that to, to help hold and cover that soil, but you know. Well, there's some cool ground covers yeah. that, that Sarah could lift up. There are some shady ground covers like a juga or vinca or um, snow on the mountain. So things that would tolerate shade and that would tolerate the dryness under a pine tree yeah. too. That, that can be another big issue for the reason that things don't grow there. It's yeah. very dry. It's pretty typical for a lot of our, our, our lawns and shade. It's shade and drought mm -hmm. from that tree sucking the, the water from underneath of it. So. Alrighty. Well, thanks for the suggestions. Uh, quickly, we have a few, so few minutes left here, a couple minutes. Um, Lauren, cherry tree branch with sap oozing out. Mm -hmm. Uh, most likely a canker. Uh, I would, not knowing for sure what it is, I'd go back about seven to ten inches and and remove that, so you're reducing that potential for spread. Alrighty, and if I it's think the main trunk. Then maybe prune at ground level. Unfortunately, well, or it or may just plant another an one and wait, and it's going to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, the ooze of death. Not good. Um, Opportunity. All right. We've got one more. Um, let's see. Spruce with uh, the, the newest needles turning brown. Um, anything out? Well, possibly doing that. I mean, Is that still winter kill maybe showing up? Possibly. Maybe. It could be herbicide drift. I mean, we can, you know, if, if the needles are a little twisted or curled, then that would make me think, you know, possibly herbicide drift. Um, but generally speaking, there aren't a lot of things that would cause the needles at the tips to turn brown. So that might be a, a great uh, example where we could use a picture. Right. You know, and it, you know, it sounds almost sounds environmental. Could be. Okay. You know, because yeah. spider mites are going to be right down to the base of yeah. the needles, and so it okay. doesn't. If so. it was if it was newly planted and uh, planted this spring, right. it could be there's a watering issue, possibly not enough water, and the plant is struggling a little bit. That could cause death of the tips. So maybe a little more information or picture. Sure. Okay. That would help. Well, thank you guys.